All right. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is a Tuesday. What is the date here? Let me look real quick. The 14th of November. The podcast is a day late due to uh, a long day of travel and a long, uh, a long week out on the road. A long, great week, actually. But, you know, you get home and you're just like, fuck, I got to lay down. <laughs> That's been my... Uh, that's that's been my uh saying for the last year fuck i gotta lay down anyway welcome to let there be talk it is a solo episode and it is brought to you by standard and strange my one-stop denim leather and boot shop located in new york berkeley slash uh oakland and new mexico you can find them at standardandstrange.com or on their instagram standard and strange go see neil and jeremy pick yourself up some denim like some uh some uh momotaro denim which i wear i love momotaro real mccoys some buco leathers some john lofgren boots this place i was just in it again in new york and every time i go it fully blows my mind at the um selection that they have there it's all of the finest Japanese clothing in one shop. It's it's perfect. It is absolutely perfect, and the owners are kick-ass. So anyway, standardandstrange.com, my sponsor. Let's get into the episode. So much to talk about today. Just got off. What we're coming down, we're winding down the last leg of the Bill Burr Arena Tour, which seems to have been about maybe a little over a year. I can't really remember when it started. It seems to me I remember we were out doing some arenas, then he did Red Rocks and shot a special, took some time off, and then uh, started back up in the arenas. And uh, here we are coming down to the last show this week at the MGM Arena in Las Vegas for the Formula One race. So... That'll be the last date of the arena tour, but I'll still be touring. I'll be doing um, Irvine Improv on December 20th. I'll also be doing a bunch of shows around Los Angeles at uh, Comedy Store. And uh, and then I got some 2024 dates early coming up. So Fort Collins, Colorado, again, at the Comedy Fort, one of my favorite clubs on the planet. And uh, a bunch of other stuff. So anyway... This is the wind down. We just got off that week run that led up to the legendary Madison Square Garden. The first date was in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Fantastic arena. It was a, a smaller arena, held about uh, 9,100, I believe. And architecturally, it was just beautiful. It looked like a spaceship from Close Encounters. Real beautiful uh, building. And it was the... First building that Dr. J played a professional basketball game in uh, uh, on the ABA. Remember that? There used to be the NBA and there's the ABA back in the old days. ABA had that badass red, white, and blue ball. And Dr. J being one of my all-time favorite players, I mean, the Dr. J converse to me is still the holy grail over any sneaker. And they reissued them a couple of years ago. And I couldn't, I didn't buy a pair. Actually, I could find them. Bill got some, but I didn't want to uh, buy them without trying them on. And they were in no stores. You could get them on the website. I could send them back. It was like, ah, fuck. And then they were disappeared. Uh, that shoe to me, you can Google it. The Dr. J Converse is just the ultimate 70s sneaker. With the with the you know the star and the fucking that you know divided by sign or not divided by what is it whatever the fucking logo you know the logo <laughs> anyway Norfolk great went into a killer skateboard shop called uh, Cardinal Skate Shop it was funny I walked in there once in a while uh, I I get a little street glory. And it's amazing to me when it happens. I'm just kind of like, oh, wow. But I walked in this skate shop and I, I'm looking around 
And I just love going into skateboard shops as a 57 year old man and just relive memories in my mind. Like, oh yeah, Dogtown. Oh, Empire Skate Skate Park, where I used to go ride my bike and skateboard and, you know, the concrete wave in LA and, and just all of that OP shorts and van sneakers. And the whole the whole fucking thing of BMX and um and skating the 70s, that late 70s, you know, skating's you know wilder than ever, of course, from Tony Hawk on. But I was talking to the owner there. First of all, I go, Hey, do you got a bathroom? And he goes, Hey, are you Dean Del Rey? And I go, Yeah, he goes, Oh man, I love your podcast. And then I was like, Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> fucking once in a while it happens, man. It makes you fucking. It, I think it pushes you back in the game whenever you're feeling a little down. Bam. But uh, anyway, he had a badass skate shop and uh, we started talking. We were talking about just how in those uh, late 70s, Dwayne Peters, uh, you know, all the skaters back then, the Dogtown guys, you know, Tony Alva, all that stuff. And um, it, it, it's just you know, so different now compared to back then, you know, cause there's so much money and the X games and all that. But back then, you know, Glenn E. Friedman uh, took some of the greatest photos of that era of just, you know, it's just dirt bag skateboard and nothing else skateboard or bike. That was your freedom. That was your freedom. Anyway. So Norfolk was fantastic. That's where we started uh cruised around the town had a coffee great audience amazing audience actually the whole run was unbelievable the next night was atlanta georgia and i was really excited for this because marcus king band had a night off and they were going to come to the show and it would i was just fired up for marcus to finally see me do stand-up comedy in a comedy atmosphere you know because he'd only seen me uh, from Instagram clips or opening for him, which was uh, a hit or miss kind of run. So, and also he was really getting ready in his mind to hit the stage. So it wasn't like he was always just out there watching me do comedy, which I still label combat comedy. <laughs> Fucking just fist up. Oh yeah, fuck you guys. <laughs> combat comedy that really... uh really got me uh, probably prepared for this uh, long year of arena runs, you know? Anyway, so Marcus came down with Drew, Drew Smithers, and uh, a few of the other guys, the horn players, and Jason, the, our great bus driver. And they came down and they got to watch some fucking ninja comedy by Burr. You know, Marcus loves Burr. And... Uh, it, it, somebody asked me, uh, does Burr get recognized when you guys are out walking around? And I said, I get surprised when he doesn't get recognized. <laughs> so we spent the evening with Marcus and the guys. And uh, after the show, everybody was smoking cigars. I was just hanging out. We were laughing, reliving the uh, the tour that Marcus and I did, telling stories and shit, bus fires and uh uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, people. Oh, which, by the way, somebody went down during the Atlanta show. And we don't know. Somebody said stroke. Or, like, Bill had like two minutes left. And all of a sudden, people were like, help, help. And I was like, fuck, I've been here before. Because on the Marcus tour, three people went down in different cities. So we all jumped up to see what was going on. And, uh, uh, I believe the person is fine, uh, but it it really uh, it was this really weird section of the show. There was only a couple minutes left, so then Bill Bill was like, "Shit, I gotta, I can't leave on that," and uh, so he stayed up there another fifteen or so and uh, told some funny stories. And then we got out of there, and then we all went and hung out. And then the next morning we flew to uh, Hollywood, Florida. And that was a little, uh, a little grim for me. You know, it was the first time being back in Florida since my mom had passed. And all I kept thinking about was 
fuck, I wish she could be here or the garden, you know? And uh, it's coming up on a year almost. She she passed away on January 2nd. It was really, it was really a rough kind of morning for me. I was trying to get that, uh, get that out of my head, you know, just to get ready for the show. But, uh, you know, I know she was there. I know she was there. I know she was at the garden and uh, I miss her every day. But I also thank her uh, every day for letting me just, you know, seek out uh, a life in the arts with no pressure of like, what are you going to do for your life? You're going to play fucking rock and roll all your life? You're not going to fucking damn it. You, you're going to be fucking poor. And rare. My, mom, my mom wasn't like that. She was like, get out there and do it. Do whatever you can. Enjoy life. You're only here once. And man, is she uh, right. Did the uh, Hollywood Florida. It was the Hard Rock. And uh, fuck, man, it's a, a it's a nice venue. It's kind of about a 5,500 seat theater-esque kind of uh, arena. And some great bands have played there. Huge bands have played there to, to like announce tours like the Stones. The Stones played there not too long ago. Unreal to see the Stones in a place like that. And then um, Motley Crue, Def Leppard played there. Uh, Guns N' Roses is played there. Uh, this is a small venue for stadium bands. So great, great, uh, great crowd too. I was pushing them a little bit. I was pushing them. I was pushing the hats. <laughs> it was fun. Did that show, flew to New York. Um, got to New York. We were there Friday and the show was Friday night at the uh, the Garden. And I think it's going to take a long, 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 long time to take in what what I experienced that that night at the garden. It was absolutely perfect. Uh, Dice did a fifteen minute set, a surprise pop in. I knew Dice was doing it for months, but uh, didn't say anything. Dice did a, a surprise set, and also Dice is doing Carnegie Hall, he announced yesterday. So Dice is in the middle of his, uh, uh, I wouldn't really say comeback tour. He's just been building it, I think, ever since Entourage, really. When he, um, you know, the story is that I read, and I should have asked him if it was real. I'm sure it was, but he's in this coffee bean and the creator of... Uh, or not the creator, the assistant of the creator for Entourage came in and said, oh, my boss is a huge Dice fan. You got to meet him. Met him. They put him in one of the seasons of Entourage. And then he did the uh, Star is Born, played Gaga's dad, which is awesome. And uh, he's been doing all kinds of stuff ever since. He's doing the wheel turn. And, you know, Bill and I are at that age where we remember the mighty Andrew Dice Clay was the uh, powerhouse in the 80s. Him and Sam Kinison were the rock and roll comedians. And they uh, they got their shot on that Rodney Dangerfield, uh, I think it was HBO uh, special. And careers exploded from that. And that's a great you know, it reminds me of Bill giving back to all kinds of comedians. You know, Rodney set that up to where he put new comedians on and gave them their shot. And Bill has done that for a lot of people, including his film, Old Dads. There's tons of comedians in that. And uh, having uh, people like myself open for him on arena tours and that Bill Burr Presents Netflix special. So, you know... There's people that give back to the community and those people are just gold to art. There's other people that get famous and they just fucking move on and forget about the people they were roaming with. Not, not Bill, not Adam Sandler, uh, not Dave Chappelle. There's people out there that just bring people with them. 
and uh, thank God for those humans. So anyway, Dice popped up there and uh, rocked it. And then uh, the Mighty Burr. The audience was electric. And I will tell you this right now. Thank God that we did that run of arenas because I was not nervous at all. Because once you're inside the garden, yes, I'm in Madison Square Garden. But I was able to get rid of that out of my mind and just go, this looks similar to some arenas we've been doing all year. And I was ready. If I had done, say, the comedy store and then had a couple nights off and then had to go do the garden, it would have been a different story. But we had just done three sta uh, not stadiums, arenas in a row. So I was ready. And the only tricky part was, you know, I usually do like 20, 25 with Bill. I was only doing uh, 10 minutes. So now the trick uh, comes down to shortening shortening your uh, set and figuring out the thread and figuring out exactly how you want it to go and that is an art like i said before when i did conan it's fucking hard to find the perfect five minute flow i've seen people just do it uh, to perfection al magical comes to mind uh, when he did conan and did the uh, day labor uh set that's perfection right there of a five minute set you can do it different ways there's people that just do like joke 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 and then there's people that do it where it's like this topic this topic and this topic and the way i wanted to do it was i start here and i just take you kind of on a little mini ride of who who i am you know, and, uh, you know, the set couldn't have gone better. I, I felt just you know, that one in the L.A. form and Red Rocks are three of the greatest nights of my life. Hands down, there's nothing better than those three uh, besides getting passed at the comedy store. Nothing better. The garden was electric and I really barely remember it because it was just like skydiving. I got up there. It was, uh, the crowd was roaring and it was awesome. And then they had a great after party for Bill. And we all went over there and hung out. Steve-O was there. Oh, Jason Momoa was in the house. Jason Momoa has been everywhere lately. Every time I open Instagram, Oh, Jason Momoa in London. Oh, here he is in Japan making a leather jacket. Here he is, got a uh, vodka out with my good friend Blaine from Made One. Here he is at Metallica. Here he is at Slayer. Here he is at Bill Burr. Here he is at Upstate New York at some punk rock show. <laughs> this guy is living it. I fucking love it, man. Hats off to that fucking guy. Traveling around, enjoying life. And making people smile and feel good. He's out there, you know, meeting fans and shit. Fucking amazing. So he was there. Uh, who else was there? Moon Zappa and uh, Amit Zappa, some friends of mine. Great. I uh, invited them to the party and we hung out and talked. Uh, lots of comedians and a lot of uh, kind words uh, hit my Instagram. And it, it just fucking made me feel good. Uh, to just be part of that comedy family. Great, great night. Then um, woke up the next day in New York and finally got to go see the Jaws play. I got to get the name of it here. I know the name of it, but I don't want to fuck it up because the shark is broken, uh, which is uh, the reason I want to look at the name because I, when I was young, I had, there's a couple books out. There was the Jaws log, which was basically kind of the logs from the shoot. There was, uh, the shark is still broken as the documentary. And this was the shark is broken. And it was wrote by Richard, uh, sorry, uh, Robert Shaw's son, Ian Shaw. And it stars Ian Shaw, Alex Brightman as Richard Dreyfus, who was genius and Colin Donnell as Roy Schneider. And they all three smoked it. The set was unbelievable. 
And I'll give you a little premise of what the play is. The play, if you are a Jaws addict like myself, and there's millions and millions of Jaws addicts out there, it was really the first film that taught me about high art and filmmaking because I was very young. My dad dropped me off at the theater in 1975, a summer. And he just basically said, yeah, I heard this one's good. Go check it out. I got to run some errands. It's basically maybe his way of like, you know, getting rid of me for a couple hours so he could go out and maybe look at chicks or something. I don't know. But he didn't go see it with me. And there was a line around the fucking corner. Now, I had not seen a line for a movie ever. And they do say that Jaws was the first uh, creation of the quote unquote blockbuster. Dick Zanuck and uh, and that whole crew had created the blockbuster, meaning the summer smasher, the movie that everyone must see. You know, it goes like Jaws, I remember. And then it's like um, uh, Star Wars, you know, these blockbusters. So, um, you know, my dad dropped me off to see that film. And I remember just... Like, wow, why are so many people here? I'd never seen that. And then I saw the film and it changed my life. So if you are a Jaws addict, like I said, you know all the the behind the scenes drama. You know all the stuff about the shark breaking. You know all the stuff about the saltwater ruining the shark and the tension between uh, Richard Dreyfus and Robert Shaw and all of that. Which, by the way, recently uh, Dreyfus went to see the play. He's the only uh, surviving uh, cast member from Jaws, the three guys. The other two passed away. He went to see it. He was uh, crying. It made me look like a fucking dick. Ah, fucking, they made me look like a fool. They played me. <laughs> he's complaining, but he still took a shot with the fucking cast. I was like, you must not have been that mad. If I, if somebody was fucking shitting on me, I wouldn't go back and take a picture of him if I was mad, you know, a picture with him. But uh, I had heard that, you know, Dreyfus over the years is kind of a, a, a diva and a whack. And, uh, you know, in his way, he's like, I'll complain and that'll get me out in the press. I haven't been in the press in a couple of years. <laughs> so... I will tell you this. Uh, they basically nailed it. It's a, a story about the behind the scenes kind of uh, tension and bonding and friendship that was going on while the fucking shark was broken. They would just sit on this boat called the Orca and wait and wait and wait and wait for scenes to be set up and shot. And sometimes it would be eight, 10 hours. And in that time, Robert Shaw would do some boozing and he would uh, unleash a little bit of fury on uh, Dreyfus, a little bit of ribbon, a little bit of uh, poking. And also uh, you have fucking uh, Roy who is there to kind of be the middleman of like, hey, quit fucking around. So they wrote this play about what, probably was going on behind the scenes and it's loaded with amazing dialogue and funny funny ass jokes who uh ian killed it with these jokes he wrote the play with another guy and the dialogue is fantastic and the set is mind-boggling it's just the it's just the boat cut in half and you can see him sitting down in the boat the exact position of that famous scene of uh, when Quint gives the um, the speech about being in, uh, you know, delivering the uh, bomb and uh, the Japanese submarine shoots a missile into their boat and it goes into the water and they're floating, waiting to be saved. And while they're waiting, sharks are eating these uh, these Navy guys. So, you know, that scene, well, that's where they're at in the boat for the play. It's about 95 minutes and it is a masterpiece.
And I, I w- wish I could see it one more time, like in the front row. I was in the third row, but I got those fucking fried ears, those Delray needs hearing aid ears. And uh, some of the stuff was like, huh, what? what? <laughs> there was a funny scene. This was funny to me. There's a funny scene where, um, you know, uh, Roy is obsessed with getting suntan and there's this kind of like one minute scene where he strips down to a speedo and gets outside of the boat. And it's like one minute and the guy's body is fucking just perfect, like a Ken doll. And you didn't need the scene, but it almost seemed to me like he was like, hey, man, I've been working out a lot. Can you think I could just uh, show off this physique in case there's any, um, you know, anyone that might want to uh, meet me, you know, hook up with me. Maybe he's single. He's like, I could just show off my body. It was fucking, the scene was hilarious. Like, what is this? It, it's literally one minute. You know, the shark's broken. He goes, I'm going to catch a little sun and just strips down to a speedo. And he's there for about a minute smoking a cigarette. And then they go, shark is working. And he's got to put his clothes back on. I'm like, this is fucking hilarious. A scene where you get to see a, uh, Almost naked man, perfect physique in his late forties. <laughs> I'm sure there's some uh, some straight dudes in there that were just like, "Oh man, I don't need that scene, man. Oh man." <laughs> oh, I love it. Anyway, oh my God, thumbs up to this uh, Jaws play and. Um, I can't wait. Uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino has redone another historic movie theater in LA and it's in my neighborhood. And I cannot wait to go see Jaws, which I do once a year. I go see it in the theater and it never gets old, but I can't wait to go see uh, Jaws in Tarantino's new theater, the Vista or the Vista, whatever. I call it the Vista. And uh, it opened this week and I'm fired up to get in there. I'm going to go see uh, Napoleon in there. Oh, which, by the way, on my flight home, I saw this movie, the Blackberry movie. And I will tell you, man, I miss the Blackberry. I hate fucking touchscreen. Apple phone's good for everything like music and recording my sets and and emails and everything, but I cannot still stand a fucking touch screen. And this Blackberry movie really took me back to back when I first started working for the Stones and we were in Europe, T-Mobile was sponsoring the tour and they gave us all Blackberries. At the time, I didn't even know what it was. And they're like, this is great. You can do a, a pin, um, you know, or that's what it was called, right? A pin. You can message each other back and forth without being charged. Because back in the day, you used to get charged for text messaging. Remember that? Fuck. Unbelievable. So um, I got the BlackBerry. And then we could communicate with each other in the arena where, you know, like, hey, I'm backstage, stage right. Where are you? Hey, meet me over here by the bus or whatever. And it was the ultimate communicator and it became a full fucking game changer in life. It was the first true smartphone that people were addicted to. And uh, it was probably the downfall of the human uh, race. That's when it started with the BlackBerry because we are way worse off with our phones, unfortunately. And we can't live without them. It's a full goddamn addiction. And I've said it a million times, if I wasn't in the um, in the entertainment business, I would not have social media. I would not have a smartphone. I would just have a flip phone and I'd go back to my simple life of uh, just fucking, you know, my own thoughts, my mind. <laughs> Gertie's over here snoring like crazy. She's all fucking bundled up. Anyway, so... This Blackberry movie's great. And it, I, I had not heard about it at all. I recommend it. It's on Amazon. And it's fantastic. It's about the, these couple of nerds that invent the fucking Blackberry. And then they become, you know, 
uh, complete fucking evil monsters because their obsession of power and corporate corporate money and uh, and you know there was one guy that that's obsessed with being the best phone ever and everything is an obsession egos and everything it's a great fucking film the acting is amazing the thing that blew me away uh the most was the soundtrack this is a small movie and and to get songs in your movie it costs a lot of money so i'm wondering how they got all these great songs i wrote them down hold on they got um <clears throat> joy division love will tear you apart they got The Stroke Someday. They got Hello Operator by the uh, White Stripes. They got Waterloo Sunset by the Kinks. Uh, and on and on and on. But just those four songs. Oh, they got an MC Hammer song in there. It's fucking crazy how much uh, amazing music they got in this film. So I recommend it a lot. The Blackberry film. And uh, man... Anyway, I'm still high as fuck from the garden. I, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to forget that. And I can't thank Bill enough for just making that dream come true, man. This guy is a fucking, just a golden friend. And he is just an amazing comedian. To be able to watch him every night, I get to watch a goddamn black belt up there every night and i learn i learn from fucking bill burr i'm watching him i'm like yeah and it doesn't get old i don't go fucking hang out somewhere while he's on i don't go fucking eat dinner or whatever i sit on the side of the stage and i watch the set and i watch how he changes it every night i watch where he ad libs stuff where he changes where he tweaks the set he's constantly keeping himself um you know entertained by by trying stuff like it, it's unbelievable and he has some of the bits in this new hour are just unreal so uh looking forward to him shooting his uh new special and you guys seeing it if you haven't seen it live and i'm looking forward to going to the mgm uh to for formula one this weekend that's going to be insane i last saw formula one in austin texas around six years ago and it is radical, which, by the way, I'm I'm ready to see this Ferrari movie uh, that that uh, Adam Driver is starring as Enzo Ferrari coming out in December. I am ready for this. I love Adam Driver and I love Ferrari and I love the history of racing. So I am ready to see this fucking film. Adam Driver is Adam Driver really reminds me when I'm in New York of that TV show Girls, which I absolutely loved. And I always shout it out still to this day. And uh, which, by the way, I saw Judd Apatow at the cellar. And I'm going to get to my cellar story in a minute here. But um, uh, I saw Judd and, and it always reminds me of, you know, New York, Williamsburg and, you know, the fucking kind of the ground zero of the hipster revolution was that TV show. And the breakout star is Adam Driver. This guy has done nothing but incredible fucking films. He crushed it. Darth Vader action, Star Wars. He crushes it in, um, oh, what was he in? He was in that fucking, oh man, he plays, I think he played a Nazi in a film. Anyway, that one he did with uh, Scarlett Johansson, the divorce one, is kind of, it is fantastic, that film. And he's, he's one of the great, great actors now. He is one of the go-to killers. It's him, Brad Pitt, and Leo, I think, are the great actors of our generation right now. And uh, Joaquin Phoenix. These fucking guys always deliver always so uh i'm ready to see that ferrari comes out back to my seller story and this is how comedy works my friends i will tell you exactly the the uh, comedy gods operate in a different way 
So I did the garden on Friday night. Then Saturday, I had five spots. It's the New York Comedy Festival going on right now. Five spots. I did one in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Art House. Jack Fink, shout out to you, my man, for getting me on there. Then I did two at the stand, which is fucking golden. Patrick over there hooking me up. Uh, 8.30 at the stand. And then I did a 10.45 at the stand. Then I went to the cellar and I did 11.45 and a 12.10 spot. Five spots on Saturday night. Running around the city after Jaws, having the time of my fucking life. Then... Esty, the booker, puts me on for four shows on Sunday at the cellar. The first one is at two o'clock, uh, the brunch show. And I show up, I'm ready to go on. I notice I'm on first on the brunch. Now, I had only done the brunch show one time in my life. I've done the cellar hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows, okay? And I have never had a bad set at the cellar. And at some of the sets I've had there have been over the fucking top in my career. Uh, for me, just like, wow, man, you know, magic spots. And it's one of the great, great, great rooms, like the Comedy Store or the Stand or Denver Comedy Works. There's these rooms that are iconic and legendary and prestigious. And it's an honor to work in them anytime you can. And so anyway, I'm doing the two o'clock and I, I go downstairs to get ready. Marcus is there, Price to take some pictures and I'm fired up. And right when I'm getting ready to go on, Esty comes down the booker. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> he's coming down to watch. And um, while the host is on, I notice the, st the, the crowd is a little stiff. I'm like, oh, I'm all right. I'm still fucking high from the five sets I did last night that killed and the garden and the run of the last fucking couple months. I hadn't bombed in a few months. And I will tell you this, you're going to fucking bomb. And anybody that doesn't bomb is just fucking playing it safe at all times. Uh, even the best bomb, you know, Burr, Chappelle, uh, all of the best will bomb. They'll have an off night or they're just trying shit and they're trying to find, find it. And then there's kind of these epic bombs. And uh, I, I've got the new nickname. I've uh, uh, Ian called and nicknamed me the, uh, the brunch bomber because uh, it's a brunch show at the cellar. It's, it starts at two o'clock on a Sunday. And it's usually loaded with tourists. They got their fucking face and pancakes and shit. Anyway, the host is on. The crowd's a little stiff. Somebody's fucking phone goes off and the phones are in those locked bags. So it's just like, boo, 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 boo. you know, now you got to get out of the room and open the fucking bag, you know. Uh, so he brings me up and right when I go on, the fucking phone goes off again. Now, let me tell you something. These are not excuses. I bombed. I will take the fucking bomb. And that's how it is. And, uh, you know, but I will say this people eating pancakes and a cell phone going off is going to be a recipe for disaster right at the top and then have an edgy material at two in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, but I'm not going to fucking change my style just because I'm doing the brunch show. I always find that you'll get a few people like when you do benefits, those are always fucking awkward. You're still going to be who you are. That's who they fucking booked. And, um, you know, and you'll usually get two or three fans that I'll email you after like that crowd sucked, man. I loved your bits. All right. You know? And yeah, that was the old thing. Bill Hicks always said, you know, uh, play to the highest IQ in the room or, you know, don't change, just fucking lay into it. So I get up there and I start bombing. And when you start bombing, your brain starts to go like, uh oh, oh, this ain't going good. And usually around 90% of the time, you can get yourself out of it with a, a, a bit that is 100% uh, you know, going to kill no matter what the audience is. So I switch into this other bit and I know this is going to kill and it goes like medium. And I'm like, wow, 
I'm fucked now because I don't know what I'm what I can get going here. Now I'm bombing so bad that I'm trying to fucking even remember jokes. And I know Esty's over there and then look and she's gone. So you're fucked. You're just fucked. You know what I mean? It's not like the comedy store where they're like, yeah, you bombed. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it, there's a there's a, a feeling at the cellar where if you're not killing all the time, you're just out. You're never, ever truly in unless you're a superstar. That's how I feel at the uh, cellar. Um, I never felt the freedom of just whipping out notes or riffing or, you know, or fucking around there. I'm not at that status. Now, you know, uh, look, I respect the seller to the fullest. That's why I cared and was trying to fix it. And I did kind of pull it off towards the end. I got off and it, it got good. There was a couple of comics in the hall and they're like, ah, that was fucking, I like that one bit. I'm like, dude, I just bombed. I went upstairs and I saw Esty there sitting at the uh, table and I said, fuck, that went bad. And she wouldn't even talk to me. She just turned her fucking shoulder like that. And I was like, oh, all right. You know, and I just, I already feel awful. You don't need to turn your shoulder at me and fucking make me feel awful. <laughs> you know, I get it. It didn't go good. I went on it too. And uh, the crowd didn't like it. But that night I came back and I came back like fucking, you know, I got knocked out at two and I go, fuck this. I fucking just did the garden. I've been on tour for years. I know how to do this. And uh, I went back and I'm telling you, man, I had, uh, what was it? Three of the greatest sets I've ever had in New York. And the last one, the last set of the night, these were all at the cellar was so fucking electric. I went on after Todd Berry, who is one of the great, great comedians. Todd Berry, if you don't know him, 36 years in the game. He has a new special out right now on YouTube. Uh, you, you think these kids on fucking TikTok with their uh, crowd work, where are you from? Uh, what do you do for a living? You know, are, are you single? That crowd work? No, this is Todd Berry crowd work that is fucking next level. And he has a brand new special on YouTube right now. So go see it and follow him on Instagram. Anyway, I went on after him. He is, uh, to me, he's kind of like a Bob Newhart, dry, monotonous, really cool style. I love his style and he loves great music and he's, he's fucking funny. He killed it all the time on that TV show, Louie. Anyway, I went on after him and I probably had the best set I have ever fucking had at the comedy cellar in my life. I was fucking melting people, man. And it felt so good. Of course, Esty wasn't there, you know, but it would be nice if she maybe whipped up one of the videos and went, yeah, he had a bad set. Everybody does. He's killing here now. And uh, the great Val there, the night manager, when I got off, she's like, oh, yeah. Uh, you feel good now, huh? I go, oh, fuck yeah, man. Because I was bummed on the bombing. I didn't fucking take that lightly. It's an honor to be a, a paid regular at the comedy store in the cellar and uh, and the stand in Denver. These, these clubs mean the world to me, you know? I don't take it light, so you don't need to, uh, you don't need to fucking, uh, you know, go cold on me. I'm already fucking feeling like shit. But uh, I feel great now, and I don't. I don't really. Uh, I just fucking brush that off. It's like, hey, I'm not a fucking brunch comic. The sun is out. The people are eating pancakes. I'm also. I was barely awake because I'd been out all fucking night the night before doing spots. I was barely awake. I'd never done comedy at two o five in the afternoon. Fourteen years in, almost six thousand spots. I did a show at 2.05 p.m. <laughs> anyway, from smashing at the garden to bombing at the cellar. That's how comedy works, man. It constantly fucking puts you back on the ground right away and goes, hey, 
Don't be floating around like you're fucking great. You, you're doing the work, but you're never going to be done with the work. And that's what the comedy gods let you know. I want to thank all of you for uh, just, just fucking supporting my Patreon and this podcast and my live comedy. And I'm looking forward to 2024. I can't wait to get out there on the road and uh, try to uh, work on these new bits, man. I'm going to start talking about uh, my mom and uh, honor my mom in the, uh, in the new hour and just give her, uh, give her the proper love. I miss her. And uh, I love all you guys. Thank you so much. I want to give a quick shout out to Tommy, Tommy Quark. He came down. Tommy flew in from Chicago, a Patreoner and a friend. And he's moving to Ireland. He flew in. And then Pat MC came. Uh, he's a Patreoner. Shout out to him. And um, also Steve McDonald. He went out. Uh, my old oldest friend who played guitar in my band who had never been to New York is about to turn 60 and also shout out to Keith Robinson, who has always been fucking by my side and always had my back in the comedy world. He is uh, one of my mentors and I love him. Catch him December 19th at Sony hall shooting his Netflix special. Get your tickets. Now the, uh, the, um, the link is in my stories right now, or go to sonyhall.com in New York and go see Keith Robinson shoot this Netflix special. I opened for him last Monday in New York and his new hour is fucking amazing. This man has had two strokes. He is up there with one of the funniest hours I've ever seen. And he is as real as it fucking gets. And uh, shout out to all the Comedy Cellar comics. It was great to be there and hang out and see those guys again. Uh, oh, you know who was there? Jimmy Carr. It was great to see Jimmy Carr, hang out with him. Gnome, the owner. I shot the shit with him for a while. They bought that McDonald's next to the Fat Black Pussycat. They're going to make another Comedy Cellar. Unbelievable. I've never seen a McDonald's go out of business ever. And he bought it. So he's going to have the whole block in New York of comedy. It's going to be amazing, man, if they still let me work there. Who knows? Which, by the way, I will be at the Comedy Cellar in Las Vegas in January. And those tour dates are up on the website, I believe. And uh, that's in the middle of January, seven nights at the Comedy Cellar. All right. I'm going to get out of here. And I hope you guys have a great week. Keep the candles lit. Check out the patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for bonus episodes. I'll be putting one up this week in live Zooms. And also check out the merchandise. The holidays are coming. Get your merchandise. Once again, most important, thank you, Bill Burr. I absolutely love you, man. We have had uh, some amazing times together. Keep the candles lit, my friends.